All right, well, this evening, <clears throat> we are looking at a significant chunk of, um, of Scripture, but rather than spending week after week on each of these particular items, I thought we would just try to deal with them collectively. So I want us to understand what it is that Jesus was reproving them for. I think in many cases it's, it's quite clear. And to think about what the opposite thing is, the, the righteous thing that we are to put on as we see what it is that um, we also are to put off. But let me begin by reading this, this passage. Uh, I'd like to read Luke 11, verse 37 through the, uh, the end of the chapter, uh, verse 54. Now, when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. One of the lawyers said to him in reply, Teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and some they will persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. Woe to you, lawyers! For you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you hindered those who were entering. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Well, again, I think you can see why we don't want to spend weeks in, in this particular topic, but uh, look at this basically as one package. And we might say the overarching sin that the Lord is dealing with here is their hypocrisy. Now this morning, again, we saw uh, Jesus address the second challenge that the Jews laid at his feet to show them a sign from heaven. Remember that signs are not for unbelievers. Jesus did not give them to unbelievers because of the way that they would uh, respond to them, what they would do with them. The same thing that the Jews did when they saw him cast out a demon, they tried to use it against him. Signs are for believers to confirm and strengthen their faith. Yet there was one sign that he was willing to give to the Jews, and that was the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so Jesus would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth in the grave. As Jonah was vomited out onto the land, so Jesus would be raised from the dead. And as Jonah went to preach to the Ninevites, the Gentiles, so Jesus would send his apostles first to the Jews because the promises were for them and then to the Gentiles when they rejected Jesus. And even though Jesus gave them this sign, we saw they still did not believe because of their spiritual blindness, which can only be taken away in the Lord. But because of their rejection, God has sent the gospel to the Gentiles. He has sent it to us to give us the blessings that he originally meant for them to make them jealous so that they might turn to him. 
Now, that's what Jesus just said, as we saw at the beginning. Now, when he had spoken, these were the things he had just said. Now, the next thing that happens seems rather unexpected. We might think that Jesus had so offended all the Pharisees who were listening at this point that the last thing any of them would want to do would be to invite Jesus over for lunch. But that's exactly what happened. Now, we do need to understand that the Pharisee invited Jesus over because he was looking already for a reason to accuse him. But Jesus went because there were some things that he wanted to say to the Pharisees. Now, as I've said, what follows are a series of rebukes, right, um, directed against the Jewish leaders, uh, some of their more common sins, and the overarching one being that of hypocrisy. And the way that we can use this this evening, I think the way that Jesus would intend for us to use this, is to look within ourselves to see if we should find any of these things within ourselves. If we do, we need to turn from them. We need to put them to death by His grace. But as each sin also has its opposite positive duty, we're also going to focus on that in our application. Uh, we're going to do basically what Paul talks about in Ephesians 4.28, Listen to what he says. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. In other words, stealing is wrong, okay? Uh, we learn from, from stealing, at least that, that God forbids it, that we need to stop stealing, but there's also the opposite positive duty to put on, which is instead of stealing, work so you can give. So that's the way we're going to treat these particular rebukes uh, to the Pharisees. Now, first of all, we see the circumstances under which these rebukes take place. Uh, the Pharisee invited Jesus to lunch, and Jesus accepted. But when Jesus reclined at the table and began to eat, he did it without going through the ceremonial washing. Now, this wasn't a sin on Jesus' part because ceremonial washing was not something that was required. It was a part of the Jewish tradition. Listen to what John Gill, the uh, biblical commentator, writes uh, regarding this. He says this, Pharisees not only wash their hands by immersing them up to the elbow before eating, but when they had been at markets or among any large number of people, or had reason to think they had or feared they had touched any unclean person or thing. They immerse themselves all over in water. Okay, and again, uh, Gill talks about that being the translation of the word that's used here. The Pharisees um, wanted to get rid of all the uncleanness. Uh, of course, the problem is the uncleanness wasn't outside of them. The uncleanness was within, and that's what they weren't dealing with. Now, whether the Pharisee expressed his surprise in words, Jesus, why didn't you do this? Or by his expressions, Jesus was aware that it offended him. And, of course, Jesus knew that it would offend him. And so he used this occasion to address not just that issue, but the things that were really behind the issue, the uncleanness that's within by the way, notice this. Jesus didn't wait for the Pharisee to you know, ne necessarily ask him. Jesus did something to provoke a response. Sometimes the wise thing to do is to create the open door you know, rather than waiting for the door to open so that you can say what you need to say rather than you know, hoping that the Lord might give you that opportunity. There are things we can do that will sort of provoke that door to open. Now, this is what Jesus said to the Pharisee. Now, you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you, you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which is within as charity, and all things are clean for you. Let me just paraphrase what, what Jesus is saying here. You Pharisees, you're good. You're good at looking good. You go through all the ceremonies. You make people think that you're holy. But God sees what you really are. He sees the heart. He knows the motives. He knows why you are doing what you are doing. And not only that, He sees what you are actually doing and what you really are. Thieves who would stoop so low 
as to steal. You know, he says you're full of robbery, you're full of wickedness. What is it? Who, you know, who are they stealing from? Well, as a matter of fact, they were stealing from widows. Jesus says in a parallel passage in Matthew 23, verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So you look so beautiful and spick and span on the outside. You look so holy and pious. But you are guilty of one of the worst crimes that you commit stealing from a widow. Now, Jesus also says something that's a little bit unclear in verse 41 where he says this, but give that which is within is charity, and then all things are clean for you. And by this, he can mean one of two things. Either, you know, as you do these things, you know, this, this robbery and wickedness, at the same time, you give alms to the poor, and you think that somehow that's going to make everything okay, that this is going to take away your guilt. That's one thing he could mean. Or the other thing he could mean, which is more likely, you need to give rather than steal, okay? You need to give what you have to the poor to show that your heart has been purified by God's grace, that you are uh, within what you really are without. Basically reflecting what Jesus said on another occasion, clean out the inside of the, of the dish or of the cup and the outside will become clean as well. And of course the only way that could happen is by their coming to Him. But the main point here is that the Lord is, is telling the Pharisees and He's certainly telling us as well that He's not interested in our putting on any kind of a show. He doesn't want us to act the part of a believer. He wants us to be genuine believers who have been cleansed on the inside, who have our hearts cleansed from sin and our souls filled with the Holy Spirit so that we do what, we, what He calls us to do with the right heart and with the right motives. If the inside is clean, the outside will become clean as well. So the Lord has no interest in our learning what He wants us to do and then going through the motions. He wants us to be changed from within so that we, by nature, the new nature began to do what he calls us to do from without, something that these Pharisees were not doing. They were just acting, and they were evil on the inside. Well, Jesus goes on now to pronounce three woes on the whole lot of the Pharisees that had gathered together. Woe to you, Pharisees. And I think you understand the word woe is not good. Okay? It's one of the worst things you can say. It, it literally is translated, how horrible it will be. How horrible it will be for you Pharisees in the day of God's judgment. And with each woe, Jesus gives the reason why it's going to be so horrible for them. So he says first in verse 42, But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So the Pharisees were so proficient in their keeping the law of God, he says that you tithe not only of, of the larger things, but you also tithe of the smaller things. You give a tenth of uh, the tenth that God requires to support his servants who are conducting the worship in the house of God, to support his worship. Again, you're scrupulous even going down to the very small things like the herbs that you grow in your gardens. You even give the, you know, the Lord a tenth of those things. But you disregard the, the, the weight here matters, justice and the love of God. Justice would be doing right by your neighbor, you know, not just um, uh, publicly where other people can see, but privately showing the love of God to your neighbor by instead of taking what they have, instead of robbing from them, giving to them. You see, you're, you're so scrupulous in giving to the Lord these certain things, but here's a big area that He wants you to, to be giving, but you are not doing that. Now, Jesus says that they, you know, they weren't doing anything wrong by their, by their tithing, even on their smallest gains. But what He's saying is that they shouldn't think that that was all that God required. Notice He says this, these are the things you should have done, justice and the love of God without neglecting 
the others, that is, the ones that you actually are doing. So our Lord is telling us here that um, he wants us, of course, to support his worship through our giving, but he also wants us to share what we have with those who are in need. He says, second, woe to you Pharisees in verse 43, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. You like recognition. You like people to think well of you. You like to be honored by others. Now, these chief seats, these highest seats in the synagogue were the seats that were in front. You know, I suppose in this kind of a setting, it would be like setting up a row of chairs that up here. In the synagogue, they had a row of chairs with people facing the congregation so that the congregation looking forward would be looking at these people. Those are the seats that they wanted so that everyone could see them. They'd be sitting in full view of the people. Can you imagine? Okay. And then they would stroll through the marketplace in the hopes that somebody there would recognize them and show them some kind of gesture of honor, stretch out their hands to them, uncover their head, uh, bow the knee to them. But think about how opposite that is of what the Lord wants us to do. He doesn't want us to be visible. He wants us to be invisible. He doesn't want us to be seeking to be first. He wants us to be the servant of all. Remember what happened when James and John came to Jesus and they asked, he, they asked him for the two best seats in the house, the best seats in the kingdom, and how the rest of the disciples, the ten, got angry with them, probably because they didn't think of it first. But this is what Jesus said to them in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Pharisees wanted to be first. Jesus says, we are not to seek to be first, but to be last. They wanted to be served. But Jesus says, we are not to be served, but to serve and lay down our lives for others. Jesus says, third, in verse 44, Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. You know, Jesus said on another occasion, or he, on another occasion, he rebuked them for being whitewashed sepulchers, remember? You look beautiful, you look righteous on the outside, but inside you're full of corruption and rottenness and dead men's bones. Now here he calls them concealed tombs. They're like tombs or crypts that are buried in the ground that have been concealed by the grass so that the people walk over them and they don't know they're walking over the, the tombs. And in essence, what he's saying is when people see you, they don't realize what you really are. You're full of rottenness. You're full of sin. You're full of corruption. Now again, our Lord wants us to be real. He wants us to be genuine. When people see what we're doing on the outside, uh, you know, it should reflect what we are on the inside. It shouldn't be simply an act. And let me just say that if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and are filled with His Holy Spirit, that's exactly what we will be on the inside. We will be doing what the Lord calls us to do on the outside, and we'll be doing it because we love Him because we want to serve Him, because we are moved by the Spirit of God. Um, as Paul says in, in Romans chapter 8, the, the law of the Spirit is fulfilling within us the law of God. He is leading us in the truth, and so we yield to the Spirit as He leads us in the truth, and we go the right direction. Now, having called out the Pharisees, Jesus now turns to the lawyers. He turns to the scribes, because one of them felt like Jesus' last rebuke was a little bit too close to home. He says in verse 45, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. Now, in the, K, in the King James Version, what Jesus says in the previous verse is, is this, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, if that is in the original reading, it's easy to see why the lawyer felt his toes getting stepped on when Jesus said the last thing that he said and why he was offended. But either way, it could be that or it could be because lawyers, many of the lawyers were also Pharisees. 
But Jesus then turns to them, and he begins to address their particular crimes. Verse 46, woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Now remember who the, the, the lawyers are, remember who the scribes are. They're the, the ones who copied the scriptures. They're the ones who are the experts in the law. They were the ones who were teaching the law of God to Israel. But in their teaching the law, they were also adding to them a lot of their traditions. Traditions that made life very difficult for the people of God. One example might be what they did to the Sabbath. How the Lord intended the Sabbath to be a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of refreshment for God's people. That would be a blessing for them, a day that they were to call a delight and, and honorable to the Lord. They weighed them down and made it very difficult for them. You can only walk this far and, and no further. Um, no, you can't pick heads of grain, even if you are hungry, even if you are traveling. No, you can't heal that person. You can't help somebody who's sick on this day. Their traditions made it difficult for the people. But Jesus points out, even though you've weighed them down with these traditions, you're not even willing to keep those things yourself. But what he's saying here is not so much that you're not willing to help the people do these things, but you're not willing to touch that burden yourself. You're not willing to, you know... Uh, have that weight placed upon you. You wouldn't make yourself do that, but you're telling them that's what they need to do. Now, here's an example of do as I say and not as I do. Again, the Lord would have us to be genuine. If we believe that something is God's will and we encourage other people to do it, we need to make, for, make sure, first of all, that it is what He says, but we also need to make sure that, that we're doing it, that we really believe this is His will and, and show that by our lives. That's not what the lawyers were doing. He says, secondly, this in verse 47 and 48, Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because it was they who killed them, and you build their tombs. I know that doesn't sound clear at the outset, but let's think about this for a minute. They were building tombs, they were adorning the tombs of the prophets, which is something that isn't necessarily wrong in and of itself. You know, the Lord wants us to honor those who have faithfully served Him. But what Jesus is addressing is the reason they were doing this. Uh, he goes on to say that uh, while you're adorning the, the, the tombs of the prophets, God is going to send you prophets and apostles and you're going to do the same things your fathers did to the ones who came before, the tombs that you're building. He says in verse 49, For this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill, and some they will persecute. Listen, listen again to what John Gill writes in his commentary on this section. Now, our Lord must not be understood as blaming them for barely building the tombs of the prophets and garnishing the sepulchers of the righteous, which they might have done without blame. But because they did all this that they might be thought to be very innocent and holy men and far from being guilty of the crimes their forefathers were when they were of the very self-same bloodthirsty persecuting spirit, and did and would do the same things to the prophets and apostles of the New Testament their fathers had done to the prophets of the Old. So here they are building the tombs of the prophets, honoring the prophets and so forth, and yet they're going to do the same thing to the prophets that God's going to send to them in their time that their fathers did. They were being hypocritical. But notice this, because they agreed with their fathers that God's prophets should be killed, which is what Jesus is saying. You know, you agree with them that they should be put to death, which they showed or would show by their uh, persecuting and killing the apostles and prophets God would send to them, not to mention the fact that he would kill or they would kill the greatest prophet that God had ever raised up and sent to them, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says that God was going to lay at their feet the guilt of all the prophets, all the righteous blood shed on earth, he was going to charge it to that generation. Verses 50 and 51. So that all the blood of the prophets shed since the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel 
who was the first martyr, to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, it shall be charged against this generation. You ever wondered why 70 AD was such a, a horrible event in the lives of the Jews? It's because, not just because they killed Jesus, but it was because they were charging, God was charging the, the, basically the guilt or laying the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth on that generation because that generation in putting Jesus to death and persecuting the apostles and prophets agreed with the fathers that these others should be put to death as well. By the way, that should give us some measure, I think, of concern as to whom we side with, right? If we agree with the wicked on anything, we may very well share in their judgments. But, of course, we won't do that if we belong to Jesus because we'll love righteousness and not wickedness. But those who agree with the wicked and the wicked things that people are doing will share in the same judgment as the wicked. Remember, it's a sin to desire something as well as to do it. And then finally, Jesus says this, Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and that would be the kingdom, and you hindered those who were entering. You know, the, the lawyers, by adding their traditions to the law of God, uh, their, you know, their, their additions, were um, changing the truth. And they, Jesus says, you were missing heaven. You, you were failing to enter into heaven. And those you're teaching are also missing entering it themselves. Now, think about this. Um, when we alter the word of God, when we alter his truth, it can hinder people from entering into the kingdom of heaven if we mess up the gospel. That's exactly what um, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do. They may be very well-meaning. They may be very sincere. But they have changed the message. And in changing the message, they have shut themselves out of the kingdom. And they're also hindering the people they go to minister to from entering into the kingdom as well. That's why it's very important that we understand the gospel that we know the truth, and that we communicate it clearly so that we can help other people find Jesus rather than keeping them from coming to Him. And that also applies to the way we live. Remember, our, our lives can either be a testimony for the gospel or against the gospel. We need to make sure, again, that we're genuine on the inside so that our lives are becoming like Jesus on the outside so that people can see there's a difference in us so that when we share the gospel with them, you know, it doesn't appear to be hypocritical. We don't put a stumbling block in their way, but become a reason for them to receive Jesus rather than a, a reason for them to reject Jesus. Now, the result of this luncheon, okay, wasn't, uh, this wasn't a lesson on how to win friends and influence people, right? Uh, Jesus stepped on the toes of these spiritual leaders. They were not enamored with what Jesus had to say. Look at the result in verses 53 and 54. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely on many subjects, plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. Now, again, here we have the perfect example of the perfect speaker, the perfect evangelist who said everything in the right way. And notice that Jesus offended people, okay? Which means that when we speak the truth... Even when we do it as gently and as graciously as we possibly can, you know, seasoning our speech with, with grace as with salt, so to speak, it's still going to expose sin. And people do not like sin exposed. Remember what Jesus said regarding the light coming into the world? He was the light. That those who are in darkness won't come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds exposed, right? Well, Jesus took the light to them on this occasion, and he's shown it, and it exposed it, and they didn't like it, and so they retaliated against him. They became hostile and angry, and, of course, we know they wanted to kill him. Well, when we speak the truth, sometimes no matter how graciously we do it, it's still going to have this kind of effect. People may get angry with us, and they may retaliate against us. We should expect there are going to be people who don't like what we have to say, which means we're going to have to say some things that people don't like. 
And that almost seems to be a crime in today's world, doesn't it? In the church, we don't want to say anything that might ruffle somebody's feathers. We just want to give them the good news and not the bad news. But we do need to remember that we need to speak the bad news as well. You've sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. We need to remember that's the only way that anyone's going to be saved. Jesus didn't come to the, to the Pharisees and lawyers and say, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's not what he said. He pointed out their sin and their hypocrisy, what they should have been doing, but what they really were doing because he knew they had a very deep you know, wound that was festering and that infection would never heal unless the Lord got in there and cleaned it out with his word. Now, we know that the same thing had to happen to us. We didn't like it when somebody came to us and pointed out our sins either when we were first confronted with the truth, but we did need to hear it in order to be saved. We needed to know that we needed a Savior before we would ever reach out and receive the Savior, and that's true of those we go to. That's the reason why John the Baptist came before Jesus. You know, he didn't come preaching the gospel, did he? He came preaching the law. He came preaching repentance in order to get the people ready to receive Jesus who was coming, and that is the way that we need to proceed as well. So may the Lord give to us the kind of heart that our Lord Jesus Christ has, you know, to be genuine on the inside, to be being changed into His image on the outside, and to have a genuine love in our hearts and concern for the souls of others that we'd be willing to speak the truth to them in order that they might be saved. Well, may the Lord help us in this area. It is what He's called us to do. It is what honors Him. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's uh, ask the Lord for His grace to do this.